All right, guys, let's uh, get ready to talk about World War I. You know, this is a, a subject that is so very important for really world history, uh, but certainly for American history. We really don't get to spend enough time on it, in my opinion, and yet it has such a huge impact. In my opinion, we're not in the Middle East right now if it wasn't for World War I and the Versailles Treaty. We would not have gone to Vietnam without World War I's aftermath. There's just so many things, not to mention just World War II and the Holocaust and all these other things that get connected to it. So, unfortunately, we spend most of the time in this chapter talking about America's very limited physical uh, contribution to the war. Because it, it does actually go on for almost four years before the United States has any um, true impact on the event. So... Um, we go forward in this, right? We, we look at the European system as it existed uh, at, at the time of the war's outbreak in 1914. And, you know, the, the map that you see here is really a consequence of a lot of events that had happened in the 19th century under what was called the Concert of Europe. And um, the Concert of Europe was basically uh, a cooperation between the major powers uh, after the defeat of Napoleon in 1815. So it's a very old system, and one of the reasons why World War I comes into effect is, in many historians' opinions, is because the concert of Europe was, was just archaic and, and not holding together. And um, various uh, secret treaties and royal marriages created this very intricate web of intrigue and sort of inconsistencies. But what we find is that the balance of powers issue really does seem to come into play here. Um, pr prior to really the 1860s, there were just a, a handful of major powers, Britain, France, Russia, to a lesser extent, Austria, and then, of course, there was the Ottoman Empire. But there were a lot of older powers, such as Spain and Portugal, Sweden even, the Netherlands. But there was also uh, new emerging powers. And predominantly, this was Germany, and to a lesser extent, Italy, neither of which existed prior to the 1860s. Italy was united, I believe, in 1866, and, and Germany was united in one empire in uh, 1870. So, one theory is that because the existing powers didn't have a way to cooperatively integrate these new powers into the system, uh, it caused conflict. But it was also very much of an imperialist war. This was a war over empires. And so um, the, the French and the British had secured a very large chunk of the world, uh, particularly in Africa and Asia. Uh, Russia had essentially created a massive uh, uh, land power that stretched over something like, what is it, 11 time zones or whatever it is. That's It's so huge. And the Ottoman had basically uh, taken over most of the Middle East all the way over into uh, North Africa. So they had all been very uh, much spread out and they included multiple nationalities and multiple ethnic groups. And this is a, a recipe for unrest. Uh, quite frankly, and you know, none of them seemed to deal with it very well. And certainly, the concert of Europe was not um, strong enough because it was what we call an informal uh, international regime. There was there was no uh, legal codes set up or any sort of central location where they would meet for debates and negotiations and things of that nature. So America's in reaction initially is, in my opinion, the reaction we have to any world event. We don't want to do it, right? It, it's it's isolationist. We we don't feel it's our problem, and certainly in 1914, most Americans could really have cared less in the sense that they felt any obligation to get involved. And so, um, the other issue for America, particularly at this period of time, was the demographic makeup of the country. 
as we've talked about in previous chapters, there's this huge influx of immigration to the United States that had continued all the way through the 19th century, where we started off with our traditional immigrants of uh, British, Irish, German, Scandinavians, and then a new influx of uh Southern Europeans, right? Italians, Spaniards, uh, Portuguese, Greeks, Armenians, uh, Jews, Russians, Slavic peoples as a whole, um, and uh, Chinese and Japanese immigrants on the West Coast. And what this meant, though, was that no matter what side of the war you took, there was a large chunk of the American population that probably didn't agree with you. So, it causes a very big problem. Certainly for Woodrow Wilson, it causes an enormous problem because he's very focused and wants to be focused on his progressive domestic agenda and quite frankly is, uh, well, he believes that he's an anti-imperialist even though he's very much of one. And so uh, the problem is is quite complicated for Americans. There, It isn't an easy choice to make. So the initial stance is what we've gone to all the time, which is American neutrality. The United States is going to stay out. Now, what did that mean in reality? So no American troops were, begin were going to be committed to any of the fighting. There would be no what we call safe havens. So if naval ships are out in a, a, what's called a hot zone and it's... Um, uh, getting contentious and for their own survival they have to flee out of the out of the battle and and seek a, a place to hide the United States ports were not going to be safe havens for those ships however American loans were available so bankers in America were given permission or I should say were not restricted to giving loans to uh, the various belligerents right and then of and then American uh, arms manufacturers were not restricted and were able to therefore provide arms to anybody who wanted to come and, and, and buy them. And so, again, we get this unusual situation where American neutrality, quote unquote, could have um, a rather weak meaning because are you really neutral if you're selling guns to someone? And if you're loaning people hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars, aren't you in a way vested into their success? And this obviously becomes a major problem and, and, and will be repeated in American history uh, since then. And then of commercial shipping, particularly agricultural products, were going to be available to uh, belligerent countries. So um, <clears throat> another problem is a perception, and this is mostly an East Coast thing uh, that still prevails, right? Um, is the view of England as our quote-unquote mother country. And so um, there is an emotional tug that happens to most Americans, especially those who study their history and realize just how much of our culture and our political system uh, derives itself from the British realities there's this tendency to become nostalgic and a little uh, defensive as far as what happens to England. So when, um, <clears throat> when American shipping goes out to sea and engages in the conflict, we come into contact with this new latest fighting vehicle called a submarine, or what the Germans called Unterseeboots, which is why they call them U-boats. And... Um, <clears throat> This was perceived by Americans, particularly American administrations, as a violation of neutral rights. So it creates a debate in the United States for whether or not there should be some level of preparedness for America's military in order to face whatever was perceived to be a threat to American uh, neutrality. But again, right, once you start saying words like preparedness, are you really... Uh, getting it right. So in the um, 1916 political campaign, uh, you know, Wilson's in a bit of a pickle here. On the one hand, he knows there's a need to get our military up to snuff to face a potential crisis. And yet he um, is campaigning for president to be reelected and can't really 
uh, tout these things because, you know, he, one of the slogans was he kept us out of war. And so, uh, you know, Wilson's whole idea of peace with honor instead of victory. Um, and you know, he, um, he, he kind of gets himself into a corner. And so, uh, Wilson offers himself as a mediator for peace talks. Uh, it's almost immediately rejected by all sides. The British and the French felt that if we weren't going to be willing to commit troops and, and more weapons and money, then we really didn't have a right to say anything. And the Germans and the Austrians and Ottoman, uh, you know, just felt like they were going to win. So why negotiate? So as America uh, mobilized, right? So in, in March of uh, 1917, uh, five U.S. merchant ships were sunk by German subs. And Wilson asked Congress to recognize that the state of war existed in the two nations. So what happens here is America's early role, role right? So um, now, although American, uh, you know, the armed forces that began to prepare for war, they were not quite ready yet, right? The Navy's first role was to protect shipping convoys from the United States, Great Britain, by providing, providing more loans to the Allies, America reinvigorated the Allies in Europe. And, and an early detachment of troops were led by uh, John Pershing. They were called the American Expeditionary Force, or the AEF. And they reached Paris in 1917, in July. Um, and so it became necessary for the government to coordinate different industries under, under their um, uh, control. And they helped to uh, raise the needed funds and conserve necessary items in order to provoke growth. So when we look at what America really provided to the cause, uh, it was um, munitions uh, or materiel, money, and then eventually men. And, and so, um, you know, I should, should state that, you know, um, the, the the role was so minimal, right? And yet it was so invigorating to the Allies. And part of this was because of the timing of the struggle. So, um, so when male recruits came in initially, it was fine. But, if, you know, there was a draft and people forget this, right? So the AEF is the American Expeditionary Force that were led by Pershing. Uh, supposedly when he arrived, he, he, he uh, said to the crowd that had gathered to welcome our troops, Lafayette, we are here, a tribute to the Marquis de Lafayette who had helped uh, the French nobleman who helped America gain independence. Uh, so a lot of the efforts that were done were voluntary. So Americans were asked to ration their, their, consum their consumption. So uh, they came up with slogans. This was uh, Herbert Hoover, uh, the director of the uh, Food Administration, who came up with Wheatless Wednesdays and Meatless Tuesdays in order to get people to um, conserve these items so that they could be used to uh, feed troops in, in the field of battle. And people started to plant victory gardens. Americans were asked to... Uh, you know, plow over their, their yards and, and plant their own vegetables so that they can, uh, you know, eat their own produce rather than the commercials, the commercial materials that were needed to send overseas. And so <clears throat> when these men went off to Europe, it created labor shortages in the United States. And so women and minorities were able to find themselves in working situations that really had not been available to them before. These were very non-traditional roles uh, for <clears throat> these groups, and particularly uh, black males. And so <clears throat> these mostly northern cities now had factory jobs available, and it provided an opportunity for, for African Americans to leave the South and... Uh, you know, gain some sort of status and agency in the United States. And we refer to it as the Great Northern Migration. And this is going to have a huge demographic and cultural effect in the United States. And it's also going to create tensions because uh, it's really the first time in American history that Northerners, right, Northern whites specifically, are going to have to 
come to terms with uh, large numbers of African Americans in their uh, neighborhoods and their communities. And this this is um, that dark moment when uh, northern whites are confronted by their own racism, which is something that they had been able to, in a sense, sort of sweep under the rug because of the Civil War and 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 Reconstruction. So, American casualties uh, were rather severe. The casualty rates were were higher than they should have been. This has a lot to do with just our naivete on some level, but also just the the different way that wars were being fought. Uh, Chemical warfare was being used, which is a a very diabolical sort of thing. And and so um, the suffering was was very great. A lot of amputations, a lot of uh, blindness and post-traumatic stress disorder, what they called shell shock. And so um, this was not a good space for most most people. So, um, <coughs> excuse me, our our troops are going to suffer quite a bit, and it has a lasting impact on on America uh, even after the war is over. So on the Western Front, which is the only place where we really did have major impact during the war. Um, Americans got most of their information from British sources. They had uh, severed uh, cable lines connecting um, mainland Europe, specifically northern Europe, which were basically German cable wires. Siemens, I believe, were the, was the German company that laid cable wires. And so Americans were essentially uh, forced in some ways to get all of their information from uh, uh, British sources and the British propaganda machinery was really quite good. In fact, Goebbels will study it quite extensively before he helps Hitler. And so, um, in America, there was an actual federal department called the War Information Board. Um, man's name was Creel, I believe, who was also a, a Hollywood producer. Um, there were also celebrity drives: Charlie Chaplin, Al Jolson, Mary Pickford. Uh, all these people. Um, Douglas Fairbanks, they're all going to go and uh, travel around the United States selling Liberty Bonds and promoting uh, scrap drives. And uh, this really pulls the American people together, but it's a very anti-German. Um, and, and because almost from the beginning, uh, the Germans are going to be seen as the culprits, right? as the main agitators of the war. And uh, so in America, this fomented in, in some just typical nativist, anti-immigrant behavior that we've seen around a country, but then gets violent. You know, uh, a number of individuals are, are killed by mob gangs that respond, but then it gets into the ridiculous. You know, uh, the German Shepherd was recalled the Liberty Hound. Uh, German chocolate cake was called Liberty Cake. I mean, just really stupid, right? Sauerkraut is Liberty Cabbage. I mean, the whole thing just got really dumb. Uh, But uh, there's the old axiom that the first uh, casualty of any war is civil liberties. And America passes a Sedition Act that made it illegal to, in a sense, uh, badmouth the war effort and and to um, suggest discooperation. And this leads to two Supreme Court cases, which have permanently, in my opinion, curbed uh, speech rights in the United States. In Schenck versus the United States, the court basically uh, basically said that, you know, you can't use incendiary speech. Uh, And then um, in the Abrams versus United States, Right, we get these different standards, and it's it's really kind of um, unusual. But basically, one of them is that, um, and I'm, I might not get the quote exactly right, but I believe it's Felix Frankfurter, the Justice Frankfurter, who says that you know your right to free speech does not include yelling fire in a crowded movie theater, right? And then uh, the court, in a separate decision, basically stated that free speech is, uh, or I should say, speech can be restricted 
if it's perceived to present what they call a clear and present danger. And, you know, these are very vague terms. And, and so, um, you know, n now you can probably begin to understand how we can get something like the Patriot Act after 9-11, uh, right? In the, in the heat of battle, we tend to uh, give up a lot of our liberties. So on the Western Front, uh, we had a problem. And it's a big problem. In 1917, Russian activist Vladimir Lenin was uh, given safe passage from Switzerland where he was in exile through Germany by the Germans and uh, sailed or I believe took a train into St. Petersburg and there he helped to foment the Bolshevik Revolution. And what happens in this uh uh, situation is that um, uh, Germany had been redeploying troops. It was a second attempt by the Germans to get to Paris called the Second Battle of the Marne. The ability to hold them off was incredibly important because when the Bolsheviks gained power in Russia, right, uh, they signed what's called the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. And this is a very critical. Uh, the Russians essentially ceded a great deal of territory, Belarus and Ukraine for the most part, in exchange for Germany's uh, ceasing of hostilities. And this is a disaster for the Allies because now uh, the Germans and the Austrians can concentrate on the Western Front and the Southern Front, which is uh, Italy. And it's, it's a potential disaster for uh, the Allies. Now, here is where I believe America becomes perceived as the quote-unquote saviors of the war. It really just so happened that the bulk of our deployment of men is going to happen in this time frame. And it's just critical. I'm now in uh, 1918. Fresh men, fresh money and material, uh, just numbers is going to provide the big push, right? The big push that goes in there. Now, for the United States, uh, this is important. Wilson, I believe, starts to perceive early in 1918, in, in January, that there's an opportunity here uh, to make it, to make a real difference. And to my take on it, uh, when he issues his 14 points, he's essentially wanting to expand progressivism to a world stage. Now, I don't think it's important to know the 14 points, but there's certain categories, right? Themes, if you will, of the 14 points. And one of those is the right of neutrals. So the United States experience prior to getting involved, and of course, pretty much the reason why we got involved, was because uh, we felt that the Germans were violating our rights of neutral shipping. And uh, we had had enough and we got in there. Now, there is, there is the whole Zimmerman note, which was an intercepted cable uh, to the German ambassador in Mexico to negotiate an alliance between Germany and Mexico so that should war break out, Mexico would declare war on the United States. And if their side won, that Mexico would get back most of the territory that it lost in the Mexican-American War in 1848. There's no indication that Mexicans were ever going to take that seriously or that it was even really ever officially proposed. But the, the telegram was real. And, and that was, in a sense, the, um, the straw that broke the camel's back. But it was really about violating our rights as neutrals. And then um, cu coupled with that is, is what freedom of the seas was actually something, if you can recall from early American history, this is something that Jefferson and Madison had been arguing a great deal. One of the reasons why, in effect, we, we went into war in 1812 against the um, British 
is because we we believed as a basically as a merchant um, and commercial enterprise, the United States, uh, we relied on shipping to survive economically, and and so we needed freedom of the seas. And of course, the Germans were violating this. Now, something that was uniquely Wilsonian. Uh, in fact, it's it's part of what the liberal school of, of international relations, or what is commonly referred to as the Wilsonian school, is this idea of free trade. Now, tariffs were the primary source of income for most countries in the world. And the United States was no different. Until we started an income tax, which was 1913, the primary source of income for the United States government was a tax on imports. And this was no different anywhere else in the world. Now, higher tariffs might protect domestic industries, but it artificially raises the cost of living for the poor and starts what they call a beggar thy neighbor policy where one country raises its import, uh, its tariffs against another, and then there's retaliation, and it's back and forth trade wars. It's the reason why people are panicking about uh, Trump's um, s- sort of tariff wars with China right now, because everybody fears that it's going to result in this, right? But the bottom line emphasis is countries that freely trade with each other are less likely to go to war with each other. And so uh, Wilson starts this conversation about international free trade and lowering of tariffs. And this is going to be revived after World War II and becomes the precursor of what we today call the World Trade Organization. So the other was the end of secret diplomacy. If you study World War I, and it's a great class to take, an entire semester on it is fantastic. But um, the, uh, you know, uh, people like Otto von Bismarck and Queen Victoria, um, King Christian of Denmark of all places, they all engaged in these private backroom understandings and agreements that were not available to public discretion or scrutiny. And so it created these very tangled alliances that once uh, Archduke Franz Ferdinand was assassinated in 1914, it triggered all of these reactions that um, were really sort of hard to stop. And, and so um, Wilson's point here was that we, we need to stop doing that, that when there is a treaty, the treaty should be made public to everyone's scrutiny. Everybody should know exactly what it is these two countries have, have agreed to, right? Uh, now, uh, so Wilson talked about something that was uniquely part of the British, French, right? The, the imperialist powers that were involved here. And this was this idea of self-determination. This is going to be a sticky wicket. When Wilson goes to France to negotiate the Versailles Treaty, this is where he is going to come right smack dab into the face of uh, George uh, Lloyd George of England and Clemenceau of France, who had absolutely no desire to promote self-determination because their empires were built of of multiple, multiple ethnic groups and national identities that they wanted no part of at all. And this is where Wilson's going to get very bogged down. And then uh, the final point was the League of Nations. Now, Wilson makes it known in his speech to Congress in January of 1918 that this is the most important thing. This is the concept of collective security, that an attack on any one member would be seen as an attack on all the members and therefore would uh, launch an attack against the offending nation. And this, Wilson believed, would be the ultimate deterrent to future wars. Hence, Hence, he believed that the World War I would be the war to end all wars. Now, Uh, As naive as that might sound, uh, we have the United Nations today uh, for that very reason. And so um, the problem, of course, is strategically, as far as negotiating power, 
Wilson is going to go to Paris with virtually no negotiating power because he has, in a sense, revealed his cards to the other guys at the table, the so-called Big Four. And uh, they know, before the negotiations even start, that Wilson's 14th point, the League of Nations, is the big thing. That's the thing he really loves, and it's his baby. And in some ways, they're going to use that to cajole uh, Wilson to give in on some of these other major points, particularly the self-determination aspect of it. It's going to be very, it's going to apply in a very limited manner. So um, what happens? The Americans arrive. There are essentially three main battles that America participates in. Uh, the Battle of San Miguel, um, uh, the um, Battle in the Ardennes, and... Um, I'm uh, blanking out on the other battle. Uh, but anyhow, th it's very limited. The The American presence is almost all in sort of like East France, Belgium, uh, Luxembourg-ish area, the Ardennes, uh, and basically pushing troops in back into Germany. Now, Germany's army was made up of a great deal of Prussian officers, uh, m most of them from... Um, noble families called Junkers, J-U-N-K-E-R-S. And they had, since the Napoleonic period, had this um, very militaristic training that included this idea that no foreign troops should be permitted on German soil. So when they felt that they were being pushed back and that the Allies could, in fact, make a presence in Germany itself, uh, German officers began to become concerned. And when they made uh, contact with the Wilson administration, they were interested in negotiating a peace settlement based on the 14 points, because for the Germans, made sense. Everything that Wilson was saying, they were willing to accommodate to some degree. Uh, but Wilson didn't want to talk to the Germans because he believed that the Kaiser was a tyrant and not a democratic person, and therefore would not want to do anything about it. Well, the German officers applied pressure, and the German government basically collapses, and the Kaiser is, is uh, sent into exile into Holland, which is where he will die, I believe in the 1940s. And uh, Germany declares itself a republic. Now, this... This animates Wilson. He's really ready to go now because it really was a war for democracy because democracy has come to Germany. Uh, but he has essentially destabilized the country and it's going to become a very raucous and contentious situation in Germany for the next really 20 years. Um, well, next 10 years primarily. But it's really not uh, a good thing. That this has happened. So when Wilson uh, gets to the end of the war, right? So in domestic politics, it became a, a big deal because in 1918, Wilson had gone out to promote Democrats for the House and Senate. And it backfired. Uh, both houses went Republican. Now for uh Wilson, this is a huge blow. And he makes a mistake that a lot of politicians make, which was that um, the American people voted wrong because they were misinformed or they just weren't really on the ball or they were focused on other things. And if he, the president, were able to just get a little bit more time, he could sell the deal and, and make it go. And this is a very egotistical thing. Um, a lot of people, uh, well, I shouldn't say a lot of people, there are some historians, um, psychohistory, as I call it, because it's based on psychological studies, uh, perceive that Wilson had what we call a messianic complex, this, this sort of subconscious belief that uh, God put them on earth for a special purpose that, that would you know save mankind or whatever. And I think that there's some truth to it when you study Wilson. He, was pretty, he had a pretty big ego. ego. Um, but I would argue that all Americans have a messianic complex. There's there's this uh, thing referred to as American exceptionalism where, you know, Americans just feel that God sort of blessed us in a special way and it's we're sort of here to like, 
be the shining example, right? With uh, uh, Win- uh, Jonathan Winthrop in uh, 1620 called a shining city on a hill. Uh, you know, it's um, and Reagan will repeat that in the 1980s. So it's a kind of a combination. However, Wilson's ego and his uh, messianism is going to come right into uh, conflict directly with European realism. And um, it's a slog. And so Wilson is going to make um, uh, a very big and I think critical error. Actually, there's two. In the Senate, well, I should back up. Any treaty negotiated by a president has to be ratified by the Senate of the United States. Otherwise, it's not a treaty and it has no legal binding on the United States at all. It's why the Paris Climate Agreement under Barack Obama is basically useless because Obama did not submit it to the Senate because he knew it wouldn't pass. Um, and therefore, it's not a treaty. People like to call it a treaty, but for Americans, legally, it's not a treaty. Uh, so Wilson was going to have to submit this to the Senate. And the Senate was now under the control of the Republicans. And the Foreign Relations Committee, which would be the first committee to deal with the, with the treaty, was now chaired by the um, Senator of Massachusetts, Henry Cabot Lodge. Now, Lodge had an ego as big, if not bigger, than Wilson's. Uh, he was a, um, a mainstay of American uh, Senate politics, and um, he was a man not to be trifled with. And he um, uh, did not like Wilson, and Wilson did not like him. But Lodge would be responsible for, uh, let's say, marshalling the treaty through the Senate process. And Wilson makes the conscious decision not to take Henry Cabot Lodge with him. Now, this makes it a double whammy. No, first, no president had ever left the United States while in office or negotiated directly with another head of state over diplomatic issues. Now, Teddy Roosevelt had negotiated a peace treaty for the Russo-Japanese War, but that was with um, diplomatic personnel not heads of state. And so Wilson was now going to go directly into negotiations and leave the country. And what we have to kind of put into our minds here is Wilson is going to take at least two weeks to sail to Europe. There's no, there are no planes to Europe. Uh, so he was going to be essentially incommunicado. He's going to be outside of the country. The vice president stays in Washington But he has very limited powers. And so Wilson is going to be gone literally for months. And and so going to Europe took Wilson out of the political game domestically. Bad decision. And then coupled with that is the refusal to take any Republicans. I believe he took one, a minor level Republican. But not taking Henry Cabot Lodge is a mistake. uh, Because... uh, Lodge is not going to witness what Wilson is put through. And he is put through the ringer by Lloyd George, Clemenceau, and Orlando of, of, it, of Italy. And it's not pretty. And Wilson is, ends up having to compromise and give in on all these different things just to get his League of Nations. And so, um, unfortunately, it's the League of Nations covenant, right? The document within the document, if you will that creates the controversy. So if you can imagine, the Versailles Treaty is a very large multiple, like hundreds of pages long. And then within the Versailles Treaty is something called the League of Nations Covenant. And then within the Covenant was something called Article 10. And Article 10 essentially obligated all members of the League to defend any other member who's under attack. Now, for many Americans, particularly constitutionalists, right, which today would be people like, uh, 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 you know, conservative Republicans who believe in originalism, uh, 
only the only the Congress can can declare war, and and to give that power to a non-American entity such as the League of Nations was considered by many people to be constitutionally faulty, if not just downright unethical and immoral. So, mind you now, Wilson's in Europe, but all the stories of these things are getting reported back to the United States and going into the American newspapers. And this allows Lodge to essentially control the debate in Washington. And this creates a three-way split within the congressional member membership. Uh, so those who supported Wilson, I call them internationalists. Uh, they're primarily Democrats, but there are some what we would refer to as progressive Republicans and um, uh, socialists, and they they supported it. Now I should add there are a lot of people who were uh, in favor of the treaty simply because historically. The Senate allows the president a certain amount of priority here, uh, what I refer to as first position in foreign policy. You know, it's the old adage that um, uh, partisanship stops at the at the ocean's edge, right? So when it comes to foreign policy, we want to try to always come together, and we just sort of acknowledge that the president does the negotiations, and it's it's an arduous task, and so we just kind of embrace it and move on. Well. Uh, uh, so there are some people in the Senate, particularly, who feel like, well, you know, the president acted in good faith and we should honor that, you know, and, and meaning not scrutinize it. Now, the largest group and growing group were the reservationists. And this is the group that Lodge himself was in. They supported the treaty. They were OK with the League of Nations, but they wanted Article 10 removed. And if Article 10 can't be removed, it should at least be at have a caveat amended with a caveat stating per congressional approval. So now there were also people in the United States that were just 100% against it. These are mostly uh, old guard or conservative Republicans, part of a group that will be called the neo-isolationists in the 1920s. They were not going to support this treaty if it were written on gold paper. So um you know, they they were the non-winnable uh, crowd, right? The irreconcilables. So, the uh, Europe after the Treaty of Versailles, right, kills all the main empires, right? The old empires are gone. The Russian Empire, the German Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and the Ottoman Empire are all uh, collapsed. And so, a vast array of new countries are created. Uh, so just in the map that you're seeing there, Finland, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, right? Poland is reconstituted. It hasn't existed since uh, the 1700s. The Czechoslovak Republic, uh, Romania, which is brought out, Hungary, Yugoslavia, right? Uh, all of these countries are created out of what was uh, the large empires of Europe. Now, the new country issue, I should say, before I move on, is, is a problem because while Americans supported um, the idea of self-determination, we find out right away that the French and the British were intriguing in very typical old world style and carving up the Middle East and the Pacific and Asia to create or expand their already existing empires. So, for instance, in the Middle East, uh, uh, the, the newly liberated peoples of the Middle East don't get their freedom. They become, quote-unquote, protectorates under Britain and France. So they literally draw sand, lines in the sand and create Syria under uh, and, and Lebanon under French control, uh, Iraq under the British, and Transjordan, uh, Palestine, which is also the British, which is uh, present-day Jordan and Israel. Um, and, you know, hopefully everybody can understand what a disaster it is. Uh, Ho Chi Minh travels to Paris to try to get some recognition for uh, the Vietnamese people to get liberation from France, which 
uh, Wilson refuses to even talk to him. What happens? Ho Chi Minh joins the French Communist Party because the Communist Party of France promised to get rid of its empire. I mean, the connections are frightening. So, um, so what happens though? Uh, Americans wanted peace without victory, meaning we're just going to accept the fact that this was a horrible war, that it should not have happened. Uh, we're going to say sorry, and we're going to um, all go back and focus on mending our communities, and we're going to move on. Well, Britain and France, and Italy, right, the Belgians, none of them are interested in moving on. They want revenge, and they believed that Germany was the main cause of this, and it's um, it, it's it's somewhat informational, I think, to read a, a recent book in 1913 called the uh, excuse me, I'm sorry, 2013, uh, that's called the Sleepwalkers. Um, I'm not remembering the gentleman's name offhand, but um, it's a fantastic book that goes into what I believe is the correct and more accurate. Uh, explanation as to why World War One happens, um, and it's it's a very a very great read, um, and so um, the the Germans are basically forced to sign a treaty where they acknowledge that they bear the guilt of the war, and you know this is where it's, what starts the the revenge among the German people, right? What we call revanchism. Right, the desire of the of the German people to avenge their uh, despoilment by the Versailles Treaty, right? And so the war guilt clause becomes a big problem. And let's not forget, there are millions of Americans who are of German ancestry, and this is really going to go over uh, poorly in the United States. And so um, the Germans are going to be forced to spend over thirty billion dollars in reparations, and that's in in, in nineteen hundred money, nineteen nineteen, ni excuse me, nineteen twenties money. That's a lot of money then, and it uh, you know for a country that's already been destabilized and their government removed, right? So for a lot of Americans, all of this seems like typical European intrigue, which was the reason why most Americans didn't want to get in the war in the first place. They really did not like it, and they really didn't like it after this. So when Wilson comes to Washington and, and gets into the negotiation, right, he refuses to compromise. He's like, look, I did this. I, this is my work. I'm the president. I get the first position in foreign policy. Your job is to advise and consent. So, you know, get over it. And it doesn't work, right? Right. So it's a mano a mano fight between Wilson and Lodge, this Mexican standoff. And Wilson decides he's going to go on the bully pulpit. He is going to get on a train. He's going to go out west and he's going to give speeches to drum up support for the, um, for the League of Nations and the Versailles Treaty. And he goes on this just absolutely strenuous fight. And he's advised by doctors not to do it. He's His wife tried to get him not to do it. And he goes out there and he literally uh, runs himself ragged. Multiple spe speeches a day. City to city to city. And so um, uh, Wilson's in Colorado. He gives a speech and he collapses from exhaustion. And by the time he gets back to Washington, he's going to suffer a stroke. For several months... He is going to be incapacitated. Uh, there's all sorts of stories and rumors about how his wife, Edith Wilson, was basically running the White House. She uh, controlled who got to see him and not see him. She was his quote-unquote official interpreter because his speech was so impaired. Um, she uh, supposedly signed his name on legislation. Uh, so in a scenario where you could probably argue that the Constitution would mandate that the vice president should have been put into control of the government. Wilson did not want that to happen, and his wife made sure it didn't. Uh, but his stroke is really the final blow to his cause uh, because uh, the, the treaty goes down in defeat in the Senate, which is a very rare thing to have happen. So Wilson, who actually had thought at one point of running for a third term, is now 
defeated. And he perceives that the new presidential election, which is 1920, so 100 years ago, uh, and he told the American people that it would be his solemn referendum, that the vote for president and the vote for the Congress would be an expression of the American people's will in reference to the Versailles Treaty and participation in the League of Nations and how the country was going to move forward. And it proved to be rather a disaster. Neo-isolationism ruled the day. Uh, Republicans kept the House and Senate. And the Republican candidate, promising normalcy, uh, won the White House, Warren Harding of, of Ohio. So Wilson um, is going to see the League of Nations come into play without a United States. So having the war be over would be a great idea. Uh, and so uh, at this time in American history, we did what we had traditionally done. As soon as war was over, we brought over truth home, we mothballed Navy boats, we got rid of all the fighting men, you know, we did all these different things. We went back to uh, having a um, uh, consumer-based economy again. But America gets afflicted by something called the Spanish flu, which is a misnomer because it's actually a, a flu that, a virus that started in the United States. It's a form of swine flu. American troops back then used to have to uh, run the farms that fed the bases and and troops in, uh, I believe it's Kansas, were um, taking care of the pigs and somehow uh, there's transmutation mutation and uh, humans got um, the virus. There was an outbreak of flu, uh, a handful of people died. Um, there was a, a new theory of disease called germ theory that had been um, uh, started in, in Europe and, and made itself to the United States. A new, a new medical college, uh, relatively new I should say, uh, Johns Hopkins in Baltimore, Maryland had uh, reconfigured its entire medical school around this theory and advised the army not to allow any men to leave. Uh, but they couldn't because they were being deployed to war. And so the army made the decision to only deploy those who did not show symptoms of the flu. And this was a disaster because uh, the men went into deployment with other troops and with other countries. And the virus uh, spread and, and mutated and found its way to Spain where the Spanish king contracted the flu and almost died. Uh, hence the Spanish flu. What happens almost a year later is that there's an even stronger mutation that affects American troops who then came back to the United States and literally people were, quote unquote, dropping dead. And um, about 600,000, about 600,000 Americans are going to die of the flu. Now, uh, to translate that to today, that would be over 2 million dead. That's a, a, a pandemic. Now, um, the, the reference for uh, the textbook I'm using, which is the Tyndall and She book that many of you have, um, uh, quotes a figure of 22 million. There's a new book, I should say a recent book out called The Great Influenza. Uh, if you can get it, it's great, great book because it, it basically believes now that number is probably closer to 100 million worldwide were killed by the, by the uh, flu because there just weren't any... Um, inoculations for it. There was no way to immunize. And in places like China and um, Russia, uh, literally millions of people are going to die without knowing what they died of. And, and there's going to be mass graves and stuff because they, the death tolls are so big. Um, in in uh, Philadelphia, I believe it's something like 20,000 people or something like that contracted the flu within a weekend because of a victory parade of troops marching through the streets. Um, and then the economic transition proved to be um, a kind of a disaster. And, and the reason for it is, back then, if we wanted to make machine guns, we had to take a factory that was making a consumer product and retool the assembly line and then make the, the product. So it's what they called the gun versus butter debate. You could either build your weapons or you could build consumer products. And so you, um, we did that for the war.
and things were great because the government bought all the materials that they that they made well now we're done and demobilization meant that the company now had to shut down retool the assembly line figure out which products they're going to make because they haven't been making a product for almost two years and uh get back and running well this leads to layoffs you know heavy layoffs and so um America is going to experience a, a, a recession, really a, a small depression, if you will, for about a year, from about late 1919 to 1921. Uh, and this is a catastrophe. Well, the war had all kinds of tensions that resulted in it. And the racial tensions were ridiculous. The Red Summer, right? Anti-black riots that happened in places like Tulsa, Oklahoma, and, and other places, just vile. Um, and the and I mean we're talking about hundreds of people being killed. This is it's it's not um, um, some sort of silly racial demonstration. These these are these are murders. These are riots that are happening, and um, the country's really not quite able to get its grip on it. And for the first time, these tensions are in northern cities, and this has huge implications for the socio. Uh, political realities that are going to happen in the 1920s. <clears throat> so uh, m more African Americans are going to move north and uh, this is going to even heighten the tensions more. Well, similar to the racial tensions is going to be the first Red Scare. Now, uh, we have to understand that um, <clears throat> today everybody knows that there's this tension between the United States and Russia. Right, and, and people tend to see it as this very historical thing. In reality, however, uh, America's tension with Russia, this deep-seated hatred, really stems from World War One, and its aftermath. Uh, the uh, the relationship between the United States and Russia prior to 1914 is exceptionally good. And, and that stems all the way back to John Quincy Adams. He was the ambassador there and became very good friends with the Tsar and his family. <clears throat> and this would be in the 19-teens, 1920s. And he is um, just, you know, he builds this ama amazing relationship that sustains itself for a very, very long time. And so, for instance, when Russia wants to sell uh, Alaska, the United States became an obvious choice for Russia because they saw us as a friendly nation. So, um, you know, so it's really very recent and it's really about the Bolshevik revolution. So, um, for a lot of Americans, there was resentment for the Russians because pulling out of the war early and signing a separate peace forced our American troops to face the full brunt of the German army, which they would not have had to do if the Russians had stayed in. This created an unbelievable resentment in the American public. And so um, when monarchists in Russia, known as white Russians, started to rise up against the Bolsheviks, the United States actually sent weapons and troops into Russia, which is, the, which is why Russians have this resentment of the United States and this, this fear that the Americans are going to come in and overthrow the government because we tried to do this right in in 19, uh, 19, 19 20. and so um, this is a problem. Now, labor unions in the United States, and we just really need to just get this off the table. Most leaders of America's labor movement were Marxists. Period. Now, if you have a Marxist worldview, you simply perceive the world as a struggle of haves and the have-nots, and you see it as an exploitation of the working classes. Now, you can have a Marxist worldview and not be a communist. If you are a communist, you are a Marxist. So there's a difference. It's, it seems very slight, but it's actually a very important difference. Now, that having been said, there were isolated 
realities in the U.S. labor movement where people were sympathizing and even promoting the Bolshevik movement, the so-called international common turn, right? The, you know, and, and so there were some people in the labor movement who were praising the communist movement, wanting it to happen. It's the topic of a movie called Reds that was done back in, the, I believe, the late, late 1970s, uh, Warren Beatty. And, the, and, and it's just the way it is. Now, to take that reality, however, and extrapolate it to everybody who belonged to a union is just downright ridiculous. And that's what happens. Uh, the um, Americans just sort of paint the entire labor movement as um, communist. And so um, there's going to be great hostility towards them. In addition... Many people who are immigrants from Eastern Europe are going to be seen as harboring communist sentiment, and and it's going to spark an anti-immigrant feeling again in the United States. But in this, in this time, which we'll see in the next chapter, it's a much bigger impact because of uh, how it's going to be handled in the United States. In fact, it's going to be restricting immigration for the first time in American history. Now the um, Attorney General of the United States is going to lead what are called the Palmer Raids, where they actually go out uh, breaking into places, sometimes without warrant, uh, looking for these weapons that basically don't appear. But I believe it's something like 1,500 and some immigrants and uh, labor movement people are going to be basically deported uh, from the United States. And... Um, and, and just an amazing breach of, of civil liberties, which I talked about earlier as one of the first victims of any war. And so politically speaking, however, there's a big big shift, right? The uh, 18th Amendment has brought on, um, uh, well, the 18th Amendment has given the federal government the power to regulate the manufacturer, transportation, and consumption of alcohol. And with this comes the Volstead Act, which starts prohibition. So the, uh, what the Republicans are going to call the noble experiment to see if we can get Americans to get off the get off the um, uh, get off the bottle. The Nineteenth Amendment, ex, uh, of course, is uh, suffrage for women, and so as of 1920, we have universal adult suffrage in the United States, meaning anybody over the age of 21 is allowed to vote. This is not going to be happening universally. Obviously, in the South, um, African Americans are going to be uh, disenfranchised in, in almost universal numbers. And so uh, most people, when they think of civil rights, think of it as a 1950s and 60s thing. But in actuality, it, it starts much earlier. The, um, the returning soldiers, black soldiers, and air, uh, uh, you know sailors and airmen who return to the United States are no longer going to be contented with their treatment when they come back. There's a regiment of black soldiers. The entire regiment was decorated by the French Croix de Guerre, which is the cross of war, which is the highest military honor they can bestow. They give it to an entire French, uh, an entire American black regiment. Now, those men are going to come home heroes and be treated like zeros, and that's not going to work. And so the civil rights movement that we all kind of recognize really is getting its modern manifestation in the 1920s as a result of the war. And so America is going to come out of World War I a strong military presence on the globe. It's going to be seen as a major world power now. And it's also going to be a truly modern global power. And this is a major difference for America on all levels.